appreciate that. Are you going to include all the lawsuits that have been dismissed? I mean, I'm telling you that now. So you have that as homework. You also have the other massive de- default uh, judgment that came from the judge against Bert. Yeah. And that's just the tip of the iceberg for him. You, you've got that included in the piece. Right. Again, so for, again strategy, I'm, I'm not going to, like, you're not going to edit my video and I'm not going to, like, like, run everything that's going in like buy you at this moment in time. Like we're not doing that. Mike, you're a little bit different than a lot of the investors we've spoke to. Uh, you are not actually a new uh, investor. The, the majority of the folks we've been talking to, it seems to be one of their very first investments, but you've actually uh, been involved in out-of-state investing for some time now? Yes, yes. I've, I've had a number of properties over the last few years. Okay, and you, how many properties have you purchased from Morris and his, uh, his group of companies? Well, I, I had intended on purchasing a couple of properties from him, but I only got to one. Typically, when I do a rental property, I like to buy a property and get it functional and cash flowing positively and make sure I'm comfortable with it before I make any further investments. So with his situation, I, I bought one property with, with all things uh, supposedly, according to the contract, it would have been just fine but it took me nearly two years to get it to cash flow. What, uh, let's, let's take a look at that deeper. What specifically was in the contract, um, laid out in that contract verse that was different than what you actually had received? Well, I mean, I had made it uh, clear that I needed a, needed a new roof and a new furnace. Those are the two big ticket items that I had made sure was actually written in the contract and in, in our, email um correspondence as well and that was agreed upon by everybody now, now aside from- well, i don't want to uh, cut you off but just to sure. clarify for everyone watching when you say you're going back and you're getting this written in the contract new roof and new furnace yeah. yes. who are you negotiating with specifically uh what company like who are you specifically speaking with yeah uh the actual agent of his was his name was james who was one okay. of his sales representative. So, so, so James is a sales representative working at Morris Invest. Yes. Okay. And he was getting, he was getting approval from, from Clayton on the deal at that time. Okay. So you're going back and forth, negotiating the terms of this deal. Uh, James is your point of contact at Morris Invest. James gets approval from Clayton himself to go ahead and write it in there that you can get a new roof and a new furnace. And then presumably you guys go ahead and close the deal. And uh, the, there was one other thing as uh, the contract was being written, I, I wanted to make sure this was a Section 8 uh, process. So I had a Section okay. 8 tenant in place. So I wanted to make sure that the Section 8 inspection was recently conducted and that all of the items on that list were at least buttoned up, which would mean like uh, they would test the, the railings and the paint and the smoke detectors and the electrical and the, the basic plumbing checks. Those are what a Section 8 inspection goes through there's a, a long punch list on that. That's why I would use a Section 8 uh, uh, property from a distance. That's one of the reasons I like using Section 8 if I'm going to do it. It's because I have that another layer of inspection. So all the Section 8 items need to be up to speed. And then the new big ticket items were a furnace and a roof. That okay. was written in our, in our purchase contract. Now, I purchased the property um, over the appraised value with those in mind was because I knew I was going to have to spend a lot of money to do that if I didn't. So that was the idea. Okay. So what did you end up purchasing it for and what did it appraise for? Uh, well, I didn't do an independent appraisal afterward, but I initially, when I purchased the property from him was 51, nine. Okay. So $51,900. Uh, the section eight tenant has still actually is still my tenant in that house. So thankfully this was a, this worked out well. Uh, on the tenant side, sometimes it doesn't work out well for the buying side and the tenant side. In this situation, the tenant remained and it is actually a, a decent tenant. I, I have to say, I do enjoy her. She's a very good tenant. So no, no problems with that. Okay. So that, so he sold you a property for 51,900 claimed there's section eight tenant and there, there was, you still have that tenant to this day. That's that true. sounds great. What's the issue here? Uh, the issue was uh, when we purchased the property, the, the roof and the furnace weren't installed. Um, after I had spent the better part of a year getting that to be done, 
I don't think it was done very well if it was ever done at all, because we still have had problems with the furnace and other issues that develop on the backside of the roof. So if they were new, I, I don't know how well that was done. Second, it took a year to get done. Um, third, when you say it took you a year, so I just want to make sure I understand this. He was supposed to, you know, you guys agreed that that would be installed before you closed the deal, but that didn't happen. So you, how did you find out that that didn't happen after? Uh, Like, yeah, we had to continue. uh, I had to have inspections done and take a look at the house and make sure that it was up to speed. When the furnace broke down, of course, I knew it wasn't new. Uh, That that didn't take long to figure out. And I'm spending four or five hundred dollars to repair furnaces. Uh, Second, I had a Section Eight inspection come around again because I was going to re re rent the place or renew the lease to the tenant. So Section 8 has to come around and do another assessment to see if they're going to raise the rent or not uh, to recalibrate, I guess, the, the monthly fee. They did that, and I got pictures of all of these punch list items that were also not done. There's no smoke detectors, no GFC outlets, GFCI outlets, no, the railings uh, were all rusted and rickety on the front and back. The fence was destroyed on the side of the yard. All, all these things were just, you know, a couple thousand dollars worth of repairs that were supposed to have been buttoned up before we even took over the property. So when you find all of this out through the Section 8 inspections, right? I presume your first course of action is to go back to Morris Invest and you're like, hey, what the hell? Well, first thing was uh, I repaired all the items. I still had a tenant living in the house, so I'm not going to sit there and fight over three or $4,000 with somebody when I have to fix a house. So I fixed everything and there was a plumbing issue as well. There was probably a $3,000 plumbing problem in in the basement and another three or $4,000 repair bill over all over the house from shutters to back roof and all sorts of places. Uh, So it was, it was a quick expense Uh, sending him another letter at this point after for about eight or nine months of trying to get these initial repairs done. I didn't even bother harassing him for more. I didn't think it was going to be worth my time to chase him down for it. Uh, I've unfortunately been through that a few times, but I also know, you know, it's ultimately my responsibility to make sure that the house is very, very livable. I don't, I don't take that lightly. I like to have a nice house for my tenants. Would you ever consider investing with Morris Invest again? Uh, not, not at this time. Why is that? Uh, I, I just like the transparency and the trust and the, the actual relationship needed to be done properly from the beginning. I mean, if everything on the contract was as such, I wouldn't have any issues. But, you know, I feel like there was a lot of uh, people in the dark on this one. They didn't know what they were even selling. How much money would you say was guaranteed to you in this contract that you actually didn't receive? Like of all the of all the items that you negotiated to yeah. get put in that contract, what yeah, roughly was the value that they didn't actually give to you? If it was around fifteen thousand dollars, I'd be I think that's probably reasonable. Um, you know, meaning the, the house, if it appraised for thirty five or thirty eight thousand dollars and I bought it for fifty one, I'm like, I did the math a few times and all the things that I saw needed to be done in that somewhere in that ballpark. I would say that's probably what was expected on my end. You know, the brand new roof, a new furnace, you know, a hot water tank, if it wasn't new, very close to new electrical should have been buttoned up. Uh, which is like GFCI, the plumbing should have been checked and, and cleared out if there's any issues, which there were. Um, any of the main Section 8 items that should have been there that would have failed inspection if it was conducted properly. Did you ever get any compensation for this 15000 $15, or so uh, shortage? No, I just moved on. I've been through a few uh, different situations in the past. I'd rather avoid <laughs> any sort of legal if I can avoid it. It's just not very effective, unfortunately. When it comes to that little bit of money, I know it sounds like a lot of money. It's not enough to be uh, going to court over, in my opinion. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to Holton Wise TV for more financial information, education, and entertainment.